Please don't skip ahead yet. Hi, this is your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian, Josh LaRue. Just need a moment of your time. A lot of people don't know, but we're not able to monetize the channel here on YouTube due to the fact that the copyright holders of the books I narrate, the movies we rip, they get the ad revenue, and also being a partner on YouTube involves a lot of rules and censorship, and to do so would make it where a lot of the content, the audiobooks, the riffs, would have to be heavily censored or deleted completely. So we depend on amazing slashaholics like you to help fund the channel and keep it going and growing for years to come. And there's several fun ways to do that. You could join our Patreon right up there. And as a patron, you can join for as low as like $2, $5, $10 a month on up as high as you want and enjoy a lot of cool gifts like free ebooks, early access, exclusive content, even voicing characters and audiobooks here on the channel. You could also go to our PayPal and use the QR code right there and uh, you can donate directly to the channel. We see all donations and we appreciate all of them. If you don't want to use the QR code or don't know how, you can use our PayPal email address, which will be in the description below and the pinned comment, as well as our Cash App uh, donation username. And a fun way to help the channel is through our Cameo right down there. Uh, on Cameo, you can ask for a birthday video, anniversary video. You can ask us to sing a song or something or ask us questions. And you can get a video from me, Alex, Sean, Master Evil, Mother Evil, the Rodeo Clown, any character from any show on the channel, or any character that I've voiced in the audiobooks. It's a fun way to help the channel. It's only $10 a video, and we'll have a lot of fun doing that. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy tonight's content. Be excellent to each other. Please consider helping the channel. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Thank you. Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood, the novelization by Landon Turner. Chapter 3. Dr. Cruz! A shrill voice penetrated the silence of the night as an eerie white fog began to disappear into the pitch blackness that surrounded Crystal Lake. Oh my God, Dr. Cruz, it's Tina! Mrs. Shepard exclaimed as she felt a rush of adrenaline seeing her daughter passed out on the dock, sticking out over the lake. She sprinted onto the dock in near hysterics, grabbing Tina and holding her up, shaking her. Tina, sweetheart, are you all right? Mrs. Shepard cried frantically. Tina, what happened? said Dr. Cruz, who walked down the dock towards the scene. Tina's eyes fluttered open at the sound of the familiar voices, and then they flickered around in fear. Where, where is he? Tina cried, looking around with a terrified expression. The doctor and Mrs. Shepard both looked at each other in bewilderment. Then they helped Tina up and hurried her back into the house. Mrs. Shepard laid her down on the couch with the blankets and went into the kitchen to brew some tea. Dr. Cruz paced the house, thinking, rubbing his jaw and observing Tina inconspicuously. As the tea was brewing, Amanda sat down next to Tina and stroked her hair, visually examining her daughter. Tears stained her cheeks. She took deep breaths of air and hugged the blanket close to her. She looked frightened out of her mind. What had she seen now, Mrs. Shepard wondered. After a few moments of tense silence, she heard the tea timer go off and she hurried into the kitchen to pour Tina a warm glass. She came back into the living room with the tea, where Dr. Cruz was now leaning against the doorframe. Tina gulped down a few warm, lengthy sips, and then shakily set the teacup down on the coffee table, hugging her knees to her chest on the couch. What happened out there? Dr. Cruz asked, his serious voice cutting through the silence. Tina looked up at him with fearful eyes, shaking her head as she tried to think. She hesitated. I... I thought I saw someone, she stammered, trying to remember those last few minutes before she had gone into mild shock and fainted. Who? Dr. Cruz asked curiously. I, I don't know, she replied. She was now completely lucid and feeling better now that her mother was close and it was all coming back to her. He came out of the lake. I know I saw him, but I can't, I can't describe him, she said. Him? Dr. Cruz asked, his interest piqued. Are you saying a man came out of the lake? Tina immediately narrowed her eyes in anger. I know what you're thinking, but this has nothing to do with my father, 
she spat at him. I'm not about to sit here and be psychoanalyzed again, Tina thought. Tina knew she saw someone, and it was not her father. She would have been sure that it was her father if she had seen him. Dr. Cruz bit his knuckles to keep from probing her and working her up even more. Then he went on, ignoring his reflexive compassion. Tina, don't run away from it, he continued stoically. Your guilt over your father's death, well, it's a powerful thing. I think it explains what we are dealing with here. But it wasn't my father, Tina protested. And your mind is manufacturing these uh, hallucinations. Tina cut him off. But it wasn't a hallucination, she cried. Yes, it was, Tina, the doctor said. Tina scrunched up her face in absolute reproach. No! she screamed. The glass in the picture of John Shepard that sat on the mantel suddenly shattered. Dark presences tend to prowl at night. Nighttime was where helpless victims of whatever beast was lurking could no longer see as well as they could during the day. It was the perfect time for slaying. One dark presence was awakening deep in the woods at Crystal Lake. Endlessly it stalked. It felt no pain. It didn't feel weary. It couldn't feel weary. It had no reasoning, no understanding, no comprehension of big questions or worldly concerns. All it needed to do was to hunt for its prey. Onward it went, straight through the woods and onto a road, breathing in the night air that was forced down into the rotting, barely functioning waterlogged lungs of the beast that roamed the darkness. Still, it was very much alive. Some would say the curse of Crystal Lake was what had awakened him time and time again. The beast knew almost nothing of its origin. Pieces of memories would come in fractured bits and shards, remnants of its long and bloody past. But now it was moving through the night, heedless of big questions. Big questions didn't concern him. The here and now concerned him. And the need for the thrill was overpowering. What the beast didn't realize was that just a few miles down the road, some unfortunate victims would be waiting. They too would become quick prey for the curse of Crystal Lake. Two headlights became slowly visible in the distance on the dirt road outside Crystal Lake, but they weren't moving. Twenty-three-year-old Mike Rogers was an average-looking guy with an average job. He worked at an office making coffee runs, typing up invoices, and performing other mundane tasks. But this weekend, he was looking forward to some leisure time in the woods with his girlfriend. He was dressed in a collared shirt and slacks, and his sandy hair was styled and gelled. Twenty-two-year-old Jane Albright stood on the side of the dark, desolate country road with her hand on her hip tapping her foot impatiently as Mike leaned down into the hood of his 1979 Chevy Impala. Piece of shit, Mike swore loudly as steam hissed out of the radiator. When's the last time you put oil in that thing? She asked as he fumbled with the cap on the oil tank. Yesterday, he grumbled. Jane rolled her eyes in the back of her head. Great, she thought. She scanned both ends of the road, looking for any oncoming headlights. Surely there had to be some latecomers to the party, she thought to herself. But knowing Mike, everyone was probably already there, waiting on him like they always were. So now, 
she realized they were pretty fucked and would likely be sleeping in the woods tonight. Maybe it would all be worth it. Maybe being stranded on the side of the road would be a funny story to tell. She couldn't wait to see the look on his face when Mike walked into the cabin and saw all of his friends. And when he saw Nick, his estranged cousin, they hadn't seen each other in some time and Jane hoped that their reuniting would be a pleasant experience. She wondered if Mike knew about the party or even had an inkling of what exactly she had planned. It had been very hush-hush and she wasn't aware of anyone spilling the beans to him. She hadn't said a word about it. And now it looked like they were going to be late to his own goddamn surprise party. And it was all the birthday boy's fault. Why hadn't he made sure the car was functional? Jane thought anxiously. Why had he decided to wait this long to leave so that nobody would be driving by to help them? It was getting late, almost 9.30, and surely they weren't going to see any passing motorists especially considering everyone was probably already at the party and had probably arrived hours ago. Sometimes Jane wondered about their relationship. She didn't know if she could handle much more of Mike's laziness and procrastination. She had worked so hard putting this weekend together for him, and this was how he was repaying her. By forcing her to spend the night stranded in a dense and dark forest? An eerie fog had started to appear in the nearby woods, and Jane shivered. The moon was full, high in the sky, providing them their only source of light, and it wasn't much. Now they were out in the woods at night. It was just the two of them. All because of his stupid car, she thought. She had told him to take it to a mechanic to check it before they left, and he didn't listen. Mikey always wanted to do things the way Mikey wanted to do them. And it had ended them up here, in the middle of nowhere with a car that wouldn't start. Plus, they were going to have to show up to the cabin in the morning and explain their situation to their rightfully worried friends. Maybe if they just stayed by the road, someone would come looking for them. After all, they were supposed to show up at the cabin at 7, but that wasn't going to happen. They were all probably worried sick or knowing them, they were probably throwing the party without them. I told you to get that thing fixed, she said. Mike smacked his head on the hood as he stood up, rubbed the spot where he had bumped it, and turned to her. Jane, I don't need this shit right now, he said, exasperated. He wiped the grease off of his shirt. Great, now your shirt's ruined, she said. Now he was going to look Horrible and dirty for the party, she thought. This was turning out to be a disaster. She had been planning it for months now. First, she talked to their friend Russell to make sure he would have his uncle's cabin available for the week. Then she had secret conversations with all of Mike's friends, including his cousin Nick. Apparently, there had been some beef between the two of them a couple of years back, something over a girl when they lived together as roommates their freshman year of college. Surprisingly, Nick had happily agreed to join them for Mike's birthday party, but now Jane didn't even think there would be a surprise party at all. It was all ruined. Everybody would probably figure that Mike bailed, pack up their things, and bail themselves tomorrow morning. A wasted effort this turned out to be, she thought miserably. All the months of anticipation led up to this? Stranded out at Crystal Lake in the middle of the night? That's what had to happen, unless they just walked the three or four miles to the lake. It sounded like the most reasonable option to her. As she brushed a strand of curly hair out of her face, she sighed. Well, you're not going to fix that thing. Let's just walk, she said. Mike stared down defeatedly at the open hood and thought for a moment. I don't know if that's a good idea. Out here? You thinking of hitchhiking too? Do you have a better idea? It's either walk or sit here and wait to have a threesome with Bigfoot, she retorted. Mike couldn't argue with her. He was much too pissed off at his car. He pictured kicking at it as hard as he could, but he restrained himself, knowing he could break a leg or a bone in his foot and make their situation even worse. Finally, after a few more moments, Mike slammed the hood down. The couple opened the trunk, got out their sleeping bags and duffel bags filled with supplies and clothes, 
and started down the road towards the lake. The road was hard-packed dirt and lined with tall pine trees. There wasn't a house or a street lamp in sight. Just endless blackness on either end of the road and the dirt leading up into oblivion. It was quiet except for the sound of owls hooting in the trees and the soft chirping of crickets. It was almost too quiet and it unnerved Jane. She kept glancing around, feeling like anything could be watching her from the shadows. Guess that's what a full moon will do to you, she thought, and now it looked like the curse of Crystal Lake was already in full effect. Here they were, stranded, castaways in the land of Crystal Lake. They walked onwards. After about two miles, Mike stopped and glanced towards the trail leading off into the woods. Let's camp out here, Mike said. He started to walk down the trail. But we're almost there, Jane protested. Mike turned around, heaving his knapsack up higher on his shoulder with a heavy sigh. Jane, I'm beat. Woods are woods. Come on. Michael, Jane said. What? he exclaimed. We're going to have to go back to the car in the morning anyway. Jane frowned. She was not about to sleep in the woods tonight, but her only other option was to tell him about the party. He was right. If they walked to the lake now, they'd have to walk all the way back for their things. Unless there was conveniently an entire group of people waiting for them at a cabin a few miles down the road. She had to tell him. Jane bit her lip, thinking. Fuck it, she thought. The party was ruined no matter what. Nick can take us, she said dejectedly. Nick? Mike asked in bewilderment. Why would he come all the way out here? Jane dropped her bags on the dirt shoulder of the road and sighed defeated. He's already here, she replied. Mike stepped closer, his eyebrows raised. What are you talking about? This was supposed to be a surprise party for your birthday, she said. She was hesitant at first, but then it all came spilling out. Everybody's waiting for us to show up. I got this great cabin and everything. No way, Mike said, grinning. Never mind the whole thing's ruined. Happy birthday, she said glumly. In the midst of their conversation, they didn't notice the two headlights approaching in the distance. It was a 1965 Plymouth, and it was headed straight for them, towards Crystal Lake. Mike saw it first, and held out his hands, waving them frantically. Hey, hey, he shouted. Jane also ran up to the side of the road and called out to the motorist. They drove right on by, leaving a cloud of dust. Mike threw his hands in the air in frustration. Eat shit, fuckheads! He screamed into the night. And just like that, they were gone. The two taillights of the Plymouth receded around a bend. They picked up their gear and kept walking, grumbling to themselves. As they continued towards the cabin with Mike having a new surge of energy from hearing about the surprise party, the night grew darker. Rustling in the leaves kept startling Jane, but she kept assuring herself that it was only nothing. Mike huddled close to her, and they walked on down the road. Another mile passed. Finally, they passed the sign that read Crystal Lake, two miles. Some birthday, Mike said. It's going to be a great birthday, Jane said. Truly sorry for him. I promise. Wait here, I'll be back in two shakes, he said dropping his gear underneath a pine tree. Just hurry, she replied. Mike walked off down a trail, and soon he too was receding into the darkness. Jane leaned against a tree and listened to the night quietly. She looked around at the woods, at the intimidating wilderness that surrounded her, and shivered in the night air. Christ, it's getting cold! Mike shouted from the woods. Jane laughed at him. She could barely make Mike out through the darkness, taking a piss just a few yards away through the trees. The only sounds she heard now were the nighttime animals coming out to make their calls and find their mates. She didn't hear the softly approaching footsteps from behind her. The presence that was now near her was far too quiet and stealthy to attract her attention. The huge, dark, looming figure, obscured by the shadows of the woods, bent down and picked up a sharp metal tent spike jutting out of the duffel bag that Mike had left lying under the tree. 
Jane didn't hear a thing. An elephantine yet incredibly dexterous hen rocketed out of the darkness and clamped around her mouth. She was viciously spun around and throttled. A hockey mask was staring right at her. The creature's rotting, meaty hand stifled the terrified scream that rose up her gullet. He was immensely strong. She could barely move in his inhumanly powerful bear hug. All she felt was helpless terror. Her eyes grew wide as she saw the sunken, rotted, and unblinking eyes of the monster that had her in his grip. Her eyes were then transfixed on the wickedly sharp tent spike in his right hand. The monster slammed her into the pine tree with such force that she felt the rugged bark pierce the flesh on her back. Jane tried to wriggle free, but it was futile. She could see her own petrified eyes in the reflection of the silver steel spike that was then rammed into her throat and then into the tree. For a split second, she felt an indescribably intense tightness in her neck, and then a splitting, tearing pain that started coursing through the rest of her body. Her masked assailant rammed the spike with his fist, sinking it in deeper, and she began to choke on blood that erupted from her mangled trachea and spilled out of her mouth. As her body stopped quivering, the monster let out a deep breath. It had been his first victim since his awakening. It always pleased him, but she could have appeased him more by putting up a fight. She had gone limp with terror in his arms. Jason enjoyed the fight. His senses were suddenly all coming back to him with the force of a lightning bolt just like the first time he had been awakened from a subterranean slumber. For so long he had waited down at the bottom of Crystal Lake, perfectly preserved by the dark force that had awakened him. It was the force that Jason had first felt as a young boy. It was a strange and intense feeling that he had, and expressing it had terrified the other children around him a feeling that would rush over him in waves, shock waves that would grip him and consume him until everything was burned out and all that was left was unquenchable bloodlust, a craving for flesh, a craving for pain and suffering, a craving for justice. Jason didn't know what justice meant, but he still had a sense of it. Biological evolution gave him that. It was the anger that fueled him to enact that justice. To him... They were all the same. To him, what he saw around him only confirmed what his mother had drilled into his brain from a young age. That they're all extremely and irrevocably sick. That they are all truly evil and needed to be punished. And that their careless actions were mortal sins to God. He had found it out the first time he had seen two teenagers having sex in the woods at Camp Crystal Lake when he was just a six-year-old child. His mind had desperately tried to piece together what they were doing at the time, and the confusion enraged him. What enraged him even more is that they had something that he would never have. Normality, humanity, joy. His mother hadn't taught him about sex, only that it was bad, extremely bad. Bad enough that they all deserved punishment. Jason didn't quite understand what any of this meant for him, but he knew one thing. There was no more human reasoning left in him. There was no more normality. Anything that could be seen as humanity had been snuffed out like someone clamping their fingers over the head of a match. And as the flames burned inside him, they left behind ash and smoldering ruins in his soul. And hatred, a deep running hatred that would fuel him to grow stronger and get better at survival. That's all Jason had known how to do for years survive. And now all he wanted to do was to annihilate anyone who came to his home. The place where it all started, Crystal Lake. With lightning reflexes, he turned his head at the faint sound of leaves rustling, and he saw the boy who was zipping up his slacks and walking out of the woods. Mike's eyes grew wide as they adjusted. All he could do was stare in horror at the sight of Jane, her dead eyes looking up to the sky as if she had been begging for God to just let her die. The tent spike was plunged all the way to the hilt through her neck, impaling her like a bug on a scientist's corkboard. Then Mike saw the enormous lumbering figure towering over him, and his knees went weak. 
Jason Voorhees stepped into the moonlight in terrifying, menacing form. He ripped the spike out of the tree, and Jane's lifeless body crumpled into the leaves. Mike didn't say a word. He turned and ran. Jason stalked after him, slowly, walking at an even pace. He knew he had plenty of time before his prey would get tired. Mike kept running, half stumbling and half falling, glancing behind him every few seconds to make sure there was enough distance between him and the hockey-masked maniac. He ran further in a blind panic, not knowing where he was going but not caring. He was in full-blown survivor mode. He glanced behind him again and Jason was hot on his trail. No matter how fast he ran, Jason was always right there. And then whoosh! A sudden, sharp, agonizing pain tore across his back. The tent spike had been hurled through the air with tremendous force. It was now lodged deep in Mike's trapezius muscle, and blood started to spill from his mouth. Mike landed on all fours and tried to scramble away through the dead leaves, but Jason was suddenly right on top of him, moving with inhuman speed. Jason slammed his boot down on Mike's spine and then yanked on the spike, lifting Mike up into the air, twisting it in deeper. Blood from Mike's punctured lung bubbled up into his throat and out his open mouth as he unleashed a hideous gagging noise, one last pitiful cry for help. Jason ripped the tent spike out of his victim, the spike that had been thrown like a dart through the air with inhuman strength and Jason felt alive once again. The maniacal urges he once had resisted, but eventually succumbed to, were now coursing through him like tiny bullets. Jason was back. Okay, Slashaholics, this was kind of a short chapter, but a really good one. This has been Chapter 3 of Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood by Landon Turner. Really enjoyed this chapter. You know, I, I can just feel Tina's panic and anxiety waking up on the dock, wondering if what she saw was real or another one of her visions, you know, and just the irritation that she has to feel from Dr. Cruz. This guy's obviously in this for himself and not to help her. But her mom isn't convinced of that. So, you know, it's really tough being a teenager. Uh, that's one of the things I carry over into parenting my two teenagers is I try to remember just how hard it was. I'm not saying teenagers have it so hard, but, you know, back then it, you felt like you couldn't talk to your parents about certain things or, you know, you just felt a lot of pressure to be a certain person for other people and all that. And I can kind of see that with Tina... You know, she doesn't want to upset her mom anymore because her mom lost her husband just like Tina lost her father. Tina feels guilty about that. Dr. Cruz has got her mom under the spell. On one hand, Tina knows that Dr. Cruz is full of shit and an asshole. On the other hand, she doesn't want to take that uh, good feeling her mom is getting thinking she's helping Tina. So, really enjoying that dynamic of the story. Uh, it's getting put across a lot better in book form, I believe, uh, than the movie did. And, uh, yeah, so, but now we got to talk about Mike and Jane. Great. I mean, that took up most of the chapter, and this was a great chapter. You know, we got a lot more uh, into their heads with the whole surprise party, not knowing about it. Um, you know, that had to be kind of... Uh, <laughs> Kind of tough on her. Like, I'm sitting here suffering, waiting out in the woods with, you know, stranded. All I got to do is tell him and we can go. Um, and then, of course, what we got with Jason. I love that little bit before Mike and Jane was introduced where we were in Jason's head as he's making his way to Crystal Lake. Which, on one hand, I'm confused because I figured whenever he came out of the lake, he would have went straight for Tina's home. But maybe he was looking for a different area. 
anyhow, any way you uh, look at it, uh, it was really cool to be in his head for just a short time before we were introduced to his next victims. And boy, did Landon do a great job uh, taking us into uh, Jason's head. Um, everybody has a different opinion, kind of, on what's going on in there. I like to think that he's kind of stunted as a uh, kid himself a little bit, you know, and also trying to seek vengeance for his mom and all that. Um, but the kills were great, uh, very vivid, uh, intense kills, and I love uh, that last line, Jason was back. So, I'm really looking forward to Chapter 4. I hope you are as well. I'll be back with that very soon. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe. Click the like button. Drop me a comment. I love to hear from you. Love to hear what you thought of tonight's chapter. Uh, this channel can't be monetized, so if you like what I do, if you appreciate what I do here, please consider joining the Patreon or donating even a buck or two to the channel through PayPal or Cash App. Or you could order a $10 Cameo video uh, on Cameo.com. All the information to do all of these things are in the description and the pinned comment. Thank you all so much. This has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying, thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. We'll see you next time. It's got a death curse!